Hello and welcome to the Road Monkey Podcast, the show that shares insightful stories to motivate, inspire and support you following your dreams on your own journeys through both work and life. One of the most incredible things we found off the back of doing this podcast is the connections that we make with the people who inspire others and this week is a wonderful example of that. Our guest this week is Joe Taylor, founder of The Wave Project. It's our sixth podcast where we delve into the world of surfing and Joe's vision, along with a team of equally incredible people, has created something truly special. The Wave Project is the surf therapy charity that harnesses the power of the ocean to improve the mental health of children and young people. Growing across more than a decade, it is now a collection of more than 6,000 volunteers who deliver surf therapy sessions across 32 locations in the UK. Joe takes us on what has been an incredible journey and talks to us about what that has been like, his experiences and the lessons learned, as well as where the project is heading in the future. We've included all the links to the WAVE project in the show notes and we cannot say enough how much we would recommend getting involved in some way, so please make sure you check that out once you've listened to this episode. We've also put all the links to the other surfing-themed episodes in the show notes, so once you've listened to today's show, please make sure you check those out. Right, let's get into it and episode 71 of the Rogue Monkey podcast, Joe Taylor and the WAVE Project. The story of the Surf Therapy Charity. Hello and welcome to the show, Joe. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Kevin. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing some time today. I've given our, our listeners and viewers a, a brief introduction, but if you can give us a little bit of an overview as to who you are and what, what your role is. Yeah, well, I'm Joe Taylor. I'm the founder and CEO of The Wave Project, a charity um, Started in Cornwall about 11 years ago and um, has now grown to um, encompass um, every uh, country in the UK. Um, so we have projects in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and we uh, use surfing and surf therapy to help uh, children and young people to improve their mental health. Fantastic. Well, it's, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of seeds we can and go into as to how it all started. So just from your earliest memories, where did the idea for all of this first come about? Yeah. Um, well, so going back to about, 90, uh, about 2006, I was um, involved in setting up a charity in Newquay that was using surfing to help disabled kids. Um, well, just, it, was, it was really just to help um, provide some uh, surfing lessons for disabled kids and um, one of the features of that charity was that uh, each of those children needed someone with them they needed like uh, a kind of a mentor or a helper to support them because they because their physical needs they needed one-to-one support but um, observing those sessions I noticed you know just the the change in their kind of demeanor um, over, over the period of the session was really noticeable. Um, and um, when I was discussing the, uh, this work later on with uh, some NHS commissioners who, I, who uh, helped support some of this work, we were talking this through and came up with the uh, theory that maybe something might be able to help with um, mental health generally as well. That's how it started, really, was just that kind of simple observation around uh, watching these kids with disabilities kind of looking so much happier after a session. And the main features, really, of those sessions were similar to what the Wave Project does now. It's surfing with someone supporting you. It's as simple as that. It's just that now the support is emotional rather than physical, or sometimes it's both, because um, it kind of uh, you know has to be with surfing, really. Um, but yeah, um, it's just about providing that kind of safe space, that sort of, um, that, I think it's important as well that with our sessions that they're delivered in small groups, um, it's quite a big social element to what the Wave Project does. So it's not like a one-to-one -one surfing lesson where, you know, I take you out as a coach and we go surfing together. It's a group session. and. Being around other children and young people is um, 
an important part of the benefits that the children get. Do you think that that's something as obviously going from seeing it, I guess, back in like 2006 to evolving to what it's done now, have you kind of not, uh, I guess, learned as you've gone along, but there's probably been lots of little bits that you've picked up in those early years that have kind of helped it evolve to what it is now? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, uh, I think what we, so really it's kind of gone in stages, really. It started out as a kind of, I suppose, a hypothetical thing, you know, will surfing help these children to feel better? And then the initial results of the um, surveys that we did before pre and post the sessions indicated that it was helping them. So that was the kind of first step. And then that had to be fleshed out with more detailed evaluation later. And that took quite a long time. I mean, sort of between about 2010 when we piloted and bearing in mind, a lot of our projects were NHS funded to so the evaluation around it was you know, reasonably robust. Um, it took to about 2014 before I was really convinced that actually there was something pretty solid in this. You know, we did a pretty detailed two year study with independent evaluators, really looking closely at the impact of surf therapy on these children and young people. I mean, until then, we weren't really allowed to call it surf therapy. Um, some of our funders actually objected to the use of the word therapy. They said, this isn't therapy, this is a surfing lesson. But after that 2014 study, that two year study, we felt comfortable calling it therapy because it was just really clear that the benefits of what was happening were therapeutic on these children and young people. Actually, in many ways, the, the outcomes are a lot more effective than other stuff they were doing. Um, and in some cases, it was complementary to what, other th to, to what they were doing elsewhere. I'm just curious really how how it has to grow into what it is because you know like anyone going through any form of NHS funding it's tough to get to a point where you know you can get a scientific piece of paper to say yeah we're good to go here we're going to back this how does it get from that stage to where it is now where you're operating all around the UK multiple sites lots of staff tons of volunteers and actually mm -hmm. Did you ever envisage that, I guess, when you were back in those early days, you know, 2010, 11, if I'd have said to you in 2021, this is what it's going to look like, would you have believed me? Uh, probably, yeah, actually. I, I think, well, it depends on what you said by, by, by early days. I think in 2010, I probably wouldn't have believed you. But I think by about 2014, 15, I think I probably would have done. And I think the reason for that is that after we did that evaluation paper, this independent evaluation, where it was just really clear that the, these short six week surf therapy session courses with, you know, where each child had a mentor, you know, it was just really, we could understand what elements uh, were, were required to deliver the outcomes we needed at that, uh, you know, at that point. So my view was that at that point, we just needed to uh, do more of it really. Um, you know, by then, we already had a project in Scotland. Um, we had um, projects starting in Wales as well, um, because people were coming forward saying they wanted to take this idea to different places. And, you know, to, to, you know we, we, I want to start one in Dorset. I want to start one here in, you know, um, South Wales coast. Or, you, know, you know, I want to go up and do, do this in Scotland. And so people were just wanting to set up their own projects. I mean, it's not difficult to set up a wave project surf therapy group. You know, you just need, you need a partner surf school on board, one that's you know, reasonably decent surf school, um, and some local volunteers, really. That's the, the two key ingredients. Um, and some training. And off you go. Um, you know, I mean, it's... Um, the, the, most of the actual work, if you can call it, if, if that's the right way to put it, the, the sort of the bit that's perhaps a bit more difficult is the, the work that happens before the children get to the beach, you know, all, all of the kind of, um, there's quite a lot of uh, like legal consents that you need to get, you need to identify the children, make sure you've got the right children on the courses, work with referral partners to do that. Um, 
and uh, and the families as well, and make sure the children themselves are kind of okay about what they're doing. Um, and that takes quite a lot of time, quite a lot of preparation time before they actually get to the, the session. But when they arrive, um, that, that actual delivery, um, yeah, can be done with quite a small group of people. Um, so yeah, it's been a, a kind of concept that's been fairly easy to, to replicate in different settings. Um, but what I was quite keen to do, and what, one of the things this 2014 study did was make sure that actually there was nothing unique about, say, like one beach in Cornwall or one surf coach or one group of volunteers that was actually delivering this therapy. And the study really found that that, that, that wasn't the case, that actually the, 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 the concept um, was worked with in different locations, different geographies, different people delivering the same thing. Um, as long as there's a couple of fundamentals that you adhere to. Yeah, and so that, that's why it's grown. Excellent. And I guess, where does it go next? Because <clears throat> obviously seen recently the news about the school and some of the other offshoots of it. And, and what, what's the bigger vision with this maybe over the next 10 years? Because obviously it's been going now just over 10 years. So what mm. does the next 10 years look like in your mind? Um, well, I think the surf therapy, so there's different, different things we're doing. I think the surf therapy uh, offer, which is the kind of small groups of um of courses of surfing courses where a child gets a kind of an adult mentor mentor working with them over a period of weeks um we, we just want to do more of that i think uh, you know children love it they, they really benefit from it it's you know there's no um no real downside for, from the children's point of view um you know they uh, at very least they get to you know, be outside for a bit, be in the sea to do something new. And at best, you know, it can be really transformative in terms of their, uh, you know, their view of themselves, their resilience, their mental health. So we want to do more of that in more settings. Um, I think there are some new ideas, though, that we've kind of brought to the surf therapy concept that we're trying to develop. I mean, one of them is Beach School. Actually, that's been running about five years. Um, and that's working with children in school time. And they come to do um, some lessons with a teacher on the beach uh, in place of being in school for usually a day a week. Over, and again, normally it's the period of half a term that they do that for. So sometimes it's a a group from one school, or it might be a small group from one school of pupils that are referred by the school, or it might be individuals from different schools who all come together. Um, but the purpose of that is really about enriching their learning and um, offering them, offering children who find it kind of hard or to concentrate in school or aren't really necessarily thriving in school to learn in a different way one day a week. And We've really found that's that's been really beneficial for those children. For those children, it's been good for their learning and good for their attitude towards learning in school generally. Um, so the beach school site that you mentioned, Kevin, is an, really trying to bring that together in one place. Um, so we're hoping to be able to do that um, in the process of you know the time of I'm talking to you. We're, we're um, me to put a planning application in um, and uh, to Cornwall Council to be able to build a beach school um, and that is to do this intervention work for children in partnership with local schools. I so, think it's it's great it's groundbreaking in the sense that it's unique in the in its approach I guess a very holistic approach to the way that we support young people and I think you know the second I caught you know wind of it on on the various platforms that it was put out on it was like wow this looks absolutely amazing and within a week one of my friends who works at a surf school out in australia had seen it and was oh, i've heard about this i see this is going on in england that's really really cool and it it's i guess it's maybe again 10 15 years ago it wouldn't have had that 
power of perhaps spreading and the news and those sorts of things so quickly do you think i guess going forwards not that it's going to make it easier but in terms of getting support and getting people involved and getting more people behind it using the the digital platforms that are out there will make that easier for you guys i hope so yeah i mean i think it's really great to hear that people you know in australia are kind of inspired by um the work we're doing here and you know and we're you know we're inspired by the work other people are doing in other places as well mm. and which is you know how you grow a movement isn't it really you, you you learn from each other and you're inspired by each other um it's not about one person or one organization doing everything i think uh, it's about people you know building on what's already there so i see us as being one player in a kind of a, a bigger global movement around surf, you know, using surfing, the sea, getting children, particularly, well, we, we focus on children and young people, but I know other organizations focus on, um, for example, veterans with PTSD or, um, you know, diff different kind of client groups. But just doing stuff that's fun and doing stuff that creates a sense of community and a bond between those people. Um, and I think the more of that we're doing, the better. Um, whether or not it makes it easier for us to do the stuff we're trying to do, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, I think there's, whatever you're doing, there's, there's always some challenges somewhere. Um, you know, nothing, nothing's easy, <laughs> is it? So, um, you know, um, but, um, but I think it's about trying to work out how you overcome those challenges uh and do the best you can to try and deliver what you can for for the people you're trying to reach and that ultimately that's all any of us can ever do um, so what's 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 been the, the bigger challenges since you know 2010 looking back now that you think maybe at the time not that it was insurmountable but you know oh, that's a tough one and you've got through it and kind of look back and think you know that great job there but it what that was tough you know if you could share some of those yeah, well, funding is always an issue with charities. I mean, you know, and that is the fundamental challenge with, you know, it's, it's finding, in, it's raising enough money to be able to deliver the things you want to do. I mean, I think people sometimes think something's charitable, therefore everything's done for free. I mean, it's true that our volunteer surf mentors give their time for free. And that is the charity's biggest asset, really, is their time. Because if we had to pay each mentor for the time they're giving, we you know, we wouldn't be able to afford to deliver what we do, as simple as that. Uh, or we would have to raise millions of pounds a year to, to be able to deliver our service. So the, our volunteers' time is absolutely our biggest asset. But we still do need to raise money for some things. I mean, you know, we do need some staff to do some some work. We actually think as a, as a charity, the way the project works really efficiently, we have about 40 staff uh, and over a 1,000 volunteer surf mentors. So... I think, you know, our donors get quite a lot of bang for their buck, um, if I can put it that way. But it just still remains a big challenge because taking kids surfing is never high on the list of uh, health priorities for, you know, for, um, there's, there's, always, there's always other more pressing things. I mean, you know, uh, isn't there? So we've got to be constantly making a case for why what we're doing. Uh, matters why, why it's important for these children and young people it's not just about going surfing and having a, a nice time for a couple of weeks it's actually fundamentally transforming how they see themselves uh, how they see their lives their opportunities and um and how other people see them as well to some extent um giving them that that sense that they can actually have some empowerment and control over their lives a lot of the kids that we work with have very low levels of resilience when we first encounter them you know they, they give up very easily they, they, they don't they don't really necessarily feel they can ever do anything their lives are always going to be bad they've got quite a negative view of their of, of their futures and we find we can turn that around in quite a short time they, they understand that actually there are lots of things out there they can do that they didn't really think they could do they, they you know it transforms their view of other people um you know, people aren't necessarily all bad you know there are some good people um both in terms of adults in their life and also as a young people as a you know, friend creating friends it's amazing actually 
it felt amazing how many kids we work with who just don't really have any friends when they join join the charity, join, join the work project, or don't really have any good friendships, if I can put it that way. Um, and just simply making a friend at something like the Wave Project can be massively important uh, for some of the kids we work with. Uh, and something that's quite hard to value, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, if you look at a sort of a health budget, well, what, what's the value in, in, in having a friend or not having a friend on you know, the impact on that, that child's life? So it's hard to quantify, but actually we all know how important it is. And it's massively overlooked. So yeah, these think, things, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, having seen it firsthand, you know, I've a number of times been walking up and down Fish Draw and seeing you guys coming down out of the car park and there's a huge group of young people with a smile on their face. And yeah. it, it, it is priceless because I think far too often, especially, and I'm not trying to be too generalistic here, but, you know, there's a lot of this with screens and not much engagement mm -hmm. Whereas actually you see those groups of young people out there and they're engaged, they're interacting with people their age and with adults, they're having a great time. And when they leave the beach, we've contributed positively in some respect, even if it's short term, sometimes, like you mentioned earlier, it's transformative for the rest of their lives. You, you've made a massive difference. But how do you, like you said earlier, with NHS funding, it's there are, have to be tangibles and numbers and spreadsheets and mm. you know KPIs that you've got to meet. So yeah, I guess it's blending like the essence of what is so powerful about what you do, but with enough, um, I guess, real world substance to actually then get the people behind you to go, yes, we can see this work. So that must have been a real, I guess, tightrope to walk over the years because you don't want to lose that essence because that's what makes it so good. Yeah, that's a really good analysis, actually, of... Um of the journey that the charity has been on over the last 10 years. I mean, you're right. It's been very important to me that we don't lose what's good about the, the, the charity by overcomplicating what we do. Um, I mean, it's very easy with something like the Wave Project to start thinking, right, well, we need more training. You know, we need to sort of do more staff training to make sure all of our mentors go trained in this and trained in that and trained in that. Now, training is really important, but actually, one of the things, one of my mantras for our, our team, our staff, our volunteers is, you know, actually the most important thing you can be at a wave project session is just to be yourself, you know, to give what you can to the young person you're working with is that's enough, actually. Um, uh, yes, it's helpful to have training, you know, in things like kind of autism awareness or kind of, you know. Uh, adverse childhood experiences or you know or trauma or you know th these things all help but actually some of the best mentors I've seen are uh, just people who just give themselves to these kids and they give them their personalities and you find I mean, the nice thing about working in a group is that you find that the children kind of naturally gravitate towards the volunteers that they feel most comfortable with and that, you know, that that's kind of okay you know we don't have to um, you know, we don't have to be too regimented about about this sort of stuff. As long as the, the kids are safe, obviously, and the, the, no, no child is left out or left feeling, you know, um, <clears throat> feeling unhappy or, or uncomfortable or you know, uh, or isolated in the group. And um, you know, you just 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 keep it quite simple, and then you know, go out there and let the sea, the surfing, you know, do the work for you and just be around and be available and um, help out where you're needed and back back away and leave them to it where you're not needed. It's, it's um, and quite a lot of that is often, is often missing from the way children are actually interacted with in, in other areas of their lives. I mean, if you think about parents, for example, I mean, I'm a parent myself and as a parent, you know, you're constantly nagging your kids about stuff, you know, and you're constantly on their backs about things. And have you done your homework? Have you got dressed? Have you put your socks on, get ready for school? Do, you know, make your breakfast, do you make your bed, walk the dog? You know, it, there's just a constant stream of things you have to be kind of chiving them along for. It's not that you're a bad parent or anything. It's just part of family life. Um, you know, and, and in school, you know, teachers are there constantly chipping them along to, to finish that essay or do this or do that. And that's just part of the job of being a teacher. But actually, there's not a lot of 
adult interactions for kids where the child is just allowed to do the things that they're comfortable doing and the, 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 the adult with them just helps them do those things. Um, yes, you know, you need a framework and our framework is going surfing. But actually what they're learning really is that actually those adults are there to help. Um, they're not there to order you about or tell you what to do, you know, and they're there to be supportive. Um, and that's a really important lesson for these kids. You know, the, you know, we're a society where we're a, you know, we're a community where p people help each other in that community. And if they go away with that one lesson, you know, that, that in itself can be quite transformative of how they actually see the rest of their lives, see all the other people around them. And I've seen it happen time and time again. So I just, I want to explore a little bit around just surf to work because I've come across that. And again, it's another strand to what you do that you know, it, it, even more value added, if you like, you know, you talk about mm. bang for your buck, but actually some of the, the social impact that you offer is incredible. So if we can just explore that a little bit. Surf to work is quite a new idea. Uh, it was actually developed um, in partnership with the Department of Work and Pensions. And it was actually their idea, funnily enough. Uh, they came to us and said, we love what you're doing and um, we think this might really work for young people uh, up to the age of about 24 on universal credit. Um, and we said, okay, well, we'll give it a go. Um, uh, and really it's, it's just simply applying the same kind of principles, surf therapy principles of sort of support, guidance, um, encouragement. Uh, and also I think, a sense of achievement and attain attainment that we're trying to give these young people in the hope that they will feel more confident to get work. Um, a lot of the like, long-term unemployed people on universal credit just have a combination of kind of low ambition uh, for themselves, low confidence sometimes, and perhaps just don't know where to get started with uh, their, their career. They just really don't know which step to take first so something like surf to work is going surfing i mean it's a, it's a shorter course it's only a month long but it's twice a week so it's a bit more intensive uh just gives them a bit of drive and a bit of focus um and i'm pleased to say we've actually had a 100 percent record with our um surf to work program in terms of the young people who've done it have gone on to get a job so far so small numbers admittedly we've only done two courses we're on uh, coming into our third course at the moment um, and we've only so far worked with one job centre, although there's another one coming on board um, uh, soon this summer. But um, yeah, it's been really great. And, um, you know, we're hoping to explore how we can do more of that kind of work. Um, you know, I think we've got to be careful as a charity that we don't end up overreaching, though, that we don't try and do too many things at once. And, uh, oh, this is a great idea, and that's a great idea. We can, you know, build a beach school, and we can do this. And that's one of my problems. I think, as a as a person, <laughs> as a CEO, is I tend to ask too much of people, and, and perhaps try to do too much. But um, so I'm aware of that, and just to rein myself in. But it's so hard when think, things are working so well. Well, this is what I'm thinking. Like, do you have quite a direct question but do you think you'd have actually got to where you are now as an organization if you hadn't been bold enough to actually reach out and go no I think we can do this and some people might go oh I'm not sure or we're not going to get funding or whatever it is and like no no we're going to make it happen like, I will find a way to make it work do you think that almost bullishness has actually got you to, to where you are because you, you have believed that it is possible and, and then taken people with you I think where I put answer that is to say I've quite carefully disguised to other people when I've had doubts about it. Um, yeah. I mean, I think bullishness is maybe the wrong word. I think um, I, I've, I think I have had doubts, yes, absolutely, about whether or not is this both the right thing to be doing for young people and is it the right thing to be doing for me? You know, should I be doing a proper job somewhere. <laughs> uh, should, I, should I have a normal job doing something like everyone else does rather than running this charity? Um, 
but actually over time, I think this is why the data has been important to me. This is why it's been very, it's mattered to me that we capture that data really honestly, because not just to prove that the charity works or to get more funding and drive it forward, but actually because I myself want to know, I wanted to know, is this actually changing anything for young people? Because if it isn't, I don't want to spend my time doing it really. And actually I've grown more confident seeing more data come in and seeing it year after year consistently seeing this data, these pre and post surveys. You know, we surveyed over 5,000 kids now um, before and after a surf therapy course, you know, and just consistently 10, 15%, you know, jumps in the kind of a conf levels of confidence, self-esteem, resilience, in terms of how they rate themselves on these uh, validated scales. I just don't think you can really argue with that, you know, um, you know, they just feel better, they feel more confident, they feel more positive, they feel ready to do new things, they, 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 they feel more confident around other people, they trust people more, it's, we just see it time and again, and I just think, well, if that's what they're, they're feeling, and that's what they're telling us, then we're doing something right, and I think my job then becomes quite easy, it's just to try and make sure we continue doing the same things, and doing it uh, with a level of consistency um, and reaching as many young people as we can um, and that's all I need to do right, as far as I can see so I think it's it's confidence but it's born out of um, what young people are telling us uh, about the about, about the work we're doing is what creates that confidence that's, that's, that's such a, an honest, I guess, deep way of putting it there, because actually you can't argue with the end user if the end user is saying to you, this is working and you're kind of going, OK, you know, because it is it's having everyone has confidence and belief in what they do. You know, that's what makes passionate people that start up these kind of organisations, what they are. But actually to hear from the end user that, you, you know, you're doing a good job and it's working and achieving what you set out for is, is such a big thing. I get final question. If you had to go back to let's say pre 2010 and give yourself some advice having navigated the last 11 years of, of the wave project journey, what would you say to yourself? I would say, um, stop worrying so much. And, um, trust the people around you a bit more. Um, and calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure. We will include, obviously, the links to what you're doing and all the projects coming up in the show notes so everyone can follow the journey and, and hopefully get behind and support what you're doing because it is so powerful and so valuable. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for your time today. No worries, Kevin. Thanks very much for getting in touch. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. And don't forget, we've got a back catalogue of content that goes all the way back to January 2020, including fighter pilots, Olympic champions, TV presenters and inspiring authors. We'd really appreciate it if you can give us a quick rate and review, however you're joining us today. And if you don't want to miss out on any future episodes, make sure you hit subscribe. Our community update drops once a month and we've got some great guest content being added, so be sure to sign up for that. And finally, we're all about inspiring and supporting as many people as possible. So if you can share this episode with one person that you think would enjoy it, that would be really, really cool. Thank you again for joining us for another episode of the Road Monkey Podcast. <laughs>